we as stewards of the earth and as gardeners need to support the insects to survive. So don't throw your egg cartons, great for starting your seeds in. The thing about this is that you can peel these off and put the whole thing in the garden. So let's make some ice cubes with edible flowers frozen inside them. Don't be afraid to garden this year. Get out there, enjoy it. If you're only going to garden, start with one thing, the plant you love to eat or want to watch grow. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Lennox. Welcome to the Zoomer. Now that we're all setting our sights on spring, it's time to plan that garden. And gardening isn't only about vegetables. Flower gardens are also going to be big this year, particularly if you're working from home and want beautiful views and lush greenery to enjoy from your workspace. Today's show is all about gardening tips, techniques, and ideas for achieving your garden dreams. As you can see, we're going to be demonstrating some of these garden tips using a variety of herbs and flowers. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. Canadians are getting their hands dirtier than ever before as they ride out the pandemic at home. That's because they're working in their gardens. Just over half grow at least one type of fruit or vegetable, while nearly one in five started a garden for the first time during COVID-19. Nearly 20% of gardeners are growing produce on balconies. Relaxation and exercise were cited as the top reasons for working those green thumbs. But the economics of gardening is equally as important, particularly as Canadians are looking for ways to save. All right, Charlie, so a new study out of the UK finds that gardening more frequently is linked to improvements in well-being, perceived stress, and physical activity. In fact, gardening every day has the same positive impact on well-being as undertaking regular, vigorous exercise like cycling and running. So who knew gardening could expend as much energy as you would at a gym? You can. <laughs> hey, so, something as simple as weeding you can lose up to 130 calories in 30 minutes. But there's more than just calories spent. Um, we're talking about mental health and wellness. In fact, Ontario doctors are starting to write prescriptions for nature. They're called park prescriptions for fight things like depression and, and, and to reduce blood pressure and all a whole host of things. And so this is becoming new and I think people are becoming more aware of it, would you say? I think, I think you're right. I don't think it's new, but I think people are becoming more aware of it. So, you know what? People have always known that when they go outside into nature, just, just without even thinking about it, the birds are singing, the wind is blowing, the, you know, there's the freshness in the air, and, and people feel better, and they know that, and, but it's always been kind of anecdotal. Lately, though, some very serious science has gone into figuring out whether there's some truth behind fresh air, bird song, and, and even microorganisms in the soil being good for you. And it turns out that it, it's all good for you. There's so many good studies going on. I mean, in, in, there's five different locations across the world. One's in California, one's in Japan, one's in Sardinia, where there's these communities of people who live well into their 80s, 90s, and 100s. And those those five communities all have something in common. And one of them is that they get physical exercise every day. The other is they eat plant-based diets. And the third thing is that they have a community. They have a social system. So it's, it's very cool because getting outside gives you exercise. Growing your own vegetables gives you the plant-based diet. And frankly, something as simple as that with your friends, you can live for a very long time. Isaac, nature prescriptions have strong roots in Japan, um, where forest bathing has been used and has been recognized as something that's good for you for so long. Tell me a little bit about that. What is forest bathing? Forest bathing is being out in the forest and you're, you're walking in the forest. You're enjoying, you're enjoying the energy that the trees are giving you. You're enjoying the energy that nature is giving you. You're basically bathing yourself in, in the forest. Some people, I'll tell you right now, I've seen forest bathing done, some people will get down to their shorts and walk around in nature. And they'll take off their shoes to touch the ground so they can, so they can do earthing as well. So it's all about getting, being, being in the middle of nature and having nature surround you so, you so you can breathe in all that great oxygen and you can breathe in all the amazing energy that 
you, the trees that nature is giving you. I mean, to think about think about like water bathing. You submerge yourself in water, forest bathing. Sum, submerge yourself in the forest and just enjoy what nature has to offer you. So literally stripping down, it allows you to touch and to feel and immerse yourself in the soil. And we know that there are so many benefits with that, right? Yes, yes, yes. You're connecting back to the earth. You're connecting back to the connecting back to the soil and connecting with the with your with the humans, with nature, with the with the with the animals out there, and realizing that you are part of a whole system, that we're not part, we're not separate from it. I love that. The entire show today is about gardening, plants, the wellness that that brings us. And so let's jump right into talking a little bit some about some of the trends for this season. Charlie, what are we seeing this year? What are some of the biggest plants that are being planted right now? Weeds, herbs, so on and so forth. <laughs> well, it's still a bit early, Marissa. Where I am, uh, we are still having cool enough weather that we're not frost free. But I, having spoken to quite a number of both the growers of plants, but also the seed suppliers, uh, they are ha just breaking all records. They broke records last year with the seed supplies, and this year, again, they're doubling their seed the sales that they've done in the past. So people are very keen to, to get gardening. And, of course, last year the garden centers were closed during the spring. So this mm -hmm. spring they are open, but many people have wanted to try their hand at starting things from seed. So whether it's, you know, tomatoes, which is the number one vegetable, herbs, which everybody loves and are super simple to grow, and flowers. And of course, I always, you know, what's on my brain right now is edible flowers, because that kind of does both, right? You get the ornamental and the, and the food. <laughs> Isaac, what about trends for city dwellers, people with limited space? What are we seeing? Okay, so, so for all the city dwellers out there, more and more people are upcycling, upcycling a lot of their materials. So they're finding old, old cartons, they're finding two little pop bottles, they're finding maybe even small boxes that they actually plant inside and put those on their balcony. Because if you have a balcony, you have limited space. You don't want too big of the containers on there. So get smaller, small, smaller things you can get, better for you. So get, to get your small containers, get your small baskets, set them aside, put your soil inside them, and grow your plants. I love that. You could even get a pallet and do it like a vertical garden. Exactly. <laughs> pallet, pallets, I've not done that yet, but I've seen it done. They are beautiful when they're done properly. All right. Well, and we'll talk about that a little bit later when we come back. Herb gardening tips and tricks. Don't go away. My Instapot has a very low setting. The yogurt setting is the lowest. And she thought, I can provide really consistent heat for my seeds. I'll put them to moist paper towel, put them in the Instapot, pull them out, and they will have germinated. When I was 38 years old and I started bleeding through my bowels and be, being very sick, some days I couldn't even really get out of bed. I struggled to get out of bed. Mm. That there had to be some connection to what I was consuming and the healing process. And then I started really researching, you know, your insides and how they really work. Mm. And I started noticing when I ate local vegetation from my garden, I felt better. And within six months, to a year of really eating that way and drinking certain teas that I, plant medicine that I grew up with in Northern Ontario, uh, my body stopped bleeding. I, I lost 90 pounds in three and a half months. Wow. I went from 238 pounds to 160 pounds. Being so sick and then starting to heal, that really was the catalyst to make me more self-sufficient and the recognition is that I didn't have to have stuff imported from China, or special stuff from California. It was by my feet. I could sit in the garden in the morning and pick whatever I wanted to cook. That was a clip from Zoomer Media's upcoming series, Healing Garden, starring Charlie Dobbin. In that clip, we heard from Gary Tebow, a self-sufficient grower who lives off vegetation from his own property, including edible flowers and herbs. Now, Charlie joins me now with some tips on how to grow, preserve, and enjoy edible flowers and herbs. Charlie, many people may not realize uh, that they have edible plants growing in their own backyard. So what are maybe some common plants that we should be watching out for that might be growing in our backyard we might not even know about? Well, I mean, that's a very great question because when you think about it, we were such traditionalists. We, we tend to think of, you know, carrots and tomatoes as food. But Gary Tebow, who we just saw from our documentary, he'll eat anything. 
So at this time of year, it would be mostly dandelions. Everybody's got some of those. And very edible. And the whole plant is edible, right from the root to the leaves, the stems, the flowers. Uh, and there's tons and tons of great minerals and nutrients in there. Um, and again, lots and lots of other weeds that are coming, poking up through in our gardens, you know, the, the famous creeping Charlie, um, the uh, uh, mouse ear chickweed. There's lots of them out there that are just, they, we call them weeds. And really all they are is plants that are growing in places we don't usually want them. Can we assume that the whole plant is typically edible? I mean, how do you know which part of the plant, which part of the petals are safe? Good point. Not all plants are edible. You really, really have to be able to identify your plants and check. I mean, there's uh, certainly Government of Canada has a great website, which is under Agriculture Canada. There's two separate sites. One is by scientific name. One is by common name. What is it's actually more of a poison uh, website than anything. So that's uh, always, always check. Don't assume that everything is edible unless you absolutely confirm the identification of the plant and that what parts are edible because there's no, no question people do die eating plants that are poisonous. Now, I know you're about to walk us through a bit of a trick for pansies, but I have to ask, what are your favorite edible plants and herbs to grow? Well, you know, I think it all started, the, the flower thing started when my daughter was about four years old and we were walking down the street and somebody had planted nasturtiums right on the edge of their, their property and they're kind of spilling out onto the sidewalk. So as we're walking along, I said to my daughter, you see that flower? And she goes, yeah. And I said, pick it. She goes, pick it. And I went, yeah, yeah, pick it. So she bent down and she picked it. And we took another step or two and I said, okay, now eat it. <laughs> she was like, eat it. I was like, yeah, eat it. <laughs> so I turned it into this whole game. And she was like, that's really cool. It's quite a spicy little flavor of a nasturtium, but they're so easy to grow and, and they're fun to grow. And every part of that plant is edible as well. But um, I'm a big basil fan. I always... I mean, right beside me here, I have a rosemary plant I've had for about three years. So it comes in in the winter and goes out uh, during the summer. Wonderful with chicken. Um, I find with things like herbs, many of them are easy to grow, but the thing is you've got to use them. So keep your herbs close to your cooking area, whether it's your barbecue or your, you know, kitchen counter. Have those plants, those, you know, those edibles that you love so much to, to uh, garnish or, or add flavor to your meals. Keep them handy and, and keep some scissors handy and snip them as you go. All right. So what are one of the ways in which we can preserve and enjoy edible flowers? So let's make some ice cubes with edible flowers frozen inside them. First, do you have what I have? A silicon ice cube tray, one of these bendy things. I do. Perfect. Whew, I think you'd organize this. So now into that ice cube tray, you're going to put distilled water. Got it. Make sure it's distilled, not bottled, not nothing but distilled in order for them to be clear. I mean, obviously any water will work, but you want these ice cubes to be as clear as possible to show off your beautiful, whatever you're going to put in here. We've got all kinds of things we can put in here. Why distilled so, and not bottled water? I tried it with bottled water and they ended up all um, cloudy because of minerals. There's minerals in all water except distilled water. There's no minerals. It's just straight H2O. So you'll have a much clearer ice cube. It's just a, an aesthetic thing. It doesn't matter otherwise. <laughs> so half the water into the freezer until they're frozen solid. So pick up a nice looking pansy flower off one of those plants. Or, yeah, off one of the plants. I've got lavender here. I've got carnations or dianthus. I've got rosemary, I've got chives. My chives are just about ready to flower. You can see the little purple buds maybe. And once they start to flower, they'll be edible as well. So now you're gonna wet that flower that's in your hands, mm -hmm. dip it in some water. Assuming that your ice cube tray now had half, were half filled with frozen ice, you would then take that wet flower and you would stick it to that uh, half ice cube. And it goes back into the freezer until the flower is frozen down, because otherwise they'll float to the surface, right? So the, now you've got the back in the freezer for an hour or so, the flower, you know, petals are now stuck, frozen to the, to the half ice cube. And then out of the freezer, finish filling your ice cube tray with that distilled water, and then um, right up to the top, and then frozen solid. So a couple hours. Okay. Once they're frozen, though, you pop them out of the ice cube tray, bag them up, and then make some more. And it's, it's pretty fun, actually. I made some here that while I've been standing here, I've been, been melting. So here's one that you can, here's my one of mine. You can see there's a pansy in there, pansy flower. I love that. In fact, we have a drink here with a pansy flower in it. I was going to say, I have a drink here. 
I'm going to make myself a nice little drink. And, and the thing too is that the color will come out of the petals. So my drink will end up getting a, a purple color because it's purple pansy. So it does have some flavor to it. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> cheers. Mmm. Mmm. It does have a flavor to it. That's yeah. yummy. Now, before I let you go, I have to ask, Instapot Gardening is all the rage right now. Our audio producer, Patrick, actually did it at home. Can we pull up that clip? What is this? Um, you know, I've seen it written about in all kinds of articles. Why are people using an Instapot? What is the benefit of that, Charlie? Okay, so this is a pretty cute idea. Uh, it, I think it's just, it's because of the seed craze that's going on right now. And it was a microbiologist, a woman in Ottawa, I think, who tried this. She was just trying to speed up the germination of, of her seeds. And she used, thought, well, you know, my Instapot has a very low setting. The yogurt setting is the lowest. And she thought, I can provide really consistent heat for my seeds. I'll put them into moist paper towel, put them in the Instapot for whatever, 12 hours, 24 hours, pull them out, and they will have germinated, which actually turned out to work pretty well. And I guess so many people have Instapots. It's, uh, it's become quite a trend. So it is a way to just speed up germination. All right. And what are some other simple ways to speed up germination if you didn't have an Instapot? Well, well we've always known that providing heat from below, uh, even if the seeds are planted into soil, heat from below will speed up the germination. And of course, growers do this all the time. They have seed, like long, long seed beds in their greenhouses where there's heat coils running beneath the soil and then the flat sits on top of that. Or it'll be like a gravel base and then the flats are sitting on top. I've used um, heating pad for years. We have a very low setting heating pad, put my seeds uh, trays on top of that. But then I had this epiphany because at my new house, I have, I'm really lucky. I have a heated bathroom floor and it's, you know, you can set the thermostat and the timer on it. So I was like, oh, wow, I could just fill my bathroom with flat, <laughs> like with seeds. And sure enough, they grow really, really quickly with that nice bottom heat. Cool. I love that. All right. Thanks, Charlie. Now, when we come back, how to create a pollinator friendly garden. That's next. Uh, overuse of pesticides has havoc on the insect population. Um, the movement of uh, what we call invasive species causes all kinds of issues for native species. This is the Canada thistle, a really good antioxidant. So what I like to do with this, especially if I have somebody that's really unable to digest food and they're really not well at all, okay. I like to take the leaves and then I pass it through my super angel juicer and I extrapolate this green juice with a lot of white foam and the foam is a high level of fat oh. and that fat is um, a powerhouse for people's gut lining and their body health and everything it just yeah. boosts you wild carrots most people just eat the carrot they don't realize that the leaves have more vitamin A than the roots do so what I do is I break off the leaf like this and I'll okay. dry them and then I'll shed all the green out. And then when I grind it up and you actually put hot water with it, you're extrapolating the vitamin A and all the mineral content. Dandelion leaves and roots are one of the best things that you can eat to help your liver. And they're a natural diuretic. Welcome back. That was another clip from the upcoming series, Healing Gardens, starring Charlie Dobbin. There we saw a clip of self-sufficient Ontario rower Gary Thibault displaying some of the ways he uses the natural weeds, herbs and flowers around his property to help heal himself and others. But in order to maintain beautiful green spaces that provide these often hidden goodies, we need pollinators. Without them, there would be limited flowers and even fewer fruits and vegetables. Charlie's back with me now on how to make your garden inviting for them. So let's start there, Charlie. Why is pollination so important? We wouldn't have any fruit if we didn't have pollination. That's the bottom line. We wouldn't have, you know, pears, peaches, apples, apricots, plums, cherries, strawberries. All of these plants require pollination and it's insects that do it. Even all the squashes, the cucumbers, it's all insect pollination. So we, we as stewards of the earth and as gardeners need to support the insects to survive provide them habitat and provide them food, which is 
what they're really doing. They're just pollinating on the side. They're mostly really after the nectar or some aspect of the, the flower. The, the pollination is just a sidebar for them. And what do we know about the status of pollinator populations? They're in trouble around the world. They're in trouble. Uh, overuse of pesticides has mm -hmm. havoc on the insect population. Um, the movement of uh, what we call invasive species causes all kinds of issues for native species. And, and that goes for both plants and animals. And of course, within the animals, I'm talking about insects as well. So yeah, we, there, there's a lot of um, worry about the lack of habitat and the lack of, of actual populations of some of these, these insects particularly. So, you know, we have to, th that's part of what, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to grow things that will very much support the wildlife, whether it's birds or bees or, you know, insects of all kinds. So what's the best way then to attract pollinators to your garden? What do they need to thrive? Well, well part of it is, is no, okay, right away, you need things flowering. You need things flowering from early in the spring to late in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the things that are flowering, we don't know when spring and fall are going to happen, but basically you want early, early flowering plants and late, late flowering plants and everything in, in between. Most of the time we put the emphasis on native species because native species are evolved for our location, wherever we may live. Uh, and the other thing is when we think about native species, it's the undomesticated, if you will, species, the ones that haven't been highly hybridized. What's happened with so much of the plant breeding is that in an effort to make the flowers bigger and fluffier and, and you know, much juicier to our eyes, we've made them far less accessible to the insects. So we went from simple five petaled roses to very much fluffy, gorgeous, but roses with hundreds of petals in one bud. So from wow. five petals to hundreds of petals and the insects cannot pollinate because they can't get in uh, through, through all those petals. Whereas a simple five petal rose is very accessible to an insect. So that, what should we be growing? We grow simple plants, we grow native plants, and we grow flowering plants that, from early spring to late fall. That's really, really interesting. I hadn't even considered that. Isaac, what do you do in your own garden to attract pollinators? Ooh, I make sure I am growing a lot of native species plants, for sure. Um, I never get rid of any dandelions I see. I keep them around for as long as they, as long as they want to bloom. That's great. But I make sure I have the, the right poll pollinators for them. So I have echinacea growing in my gardens. I have a lot of native species plants. I have the sunflowers that they love as well. The pea shoots they love. I mean, I keep make sure I have flowering, flowering vegetables, flowering bearing fruits in my garden for the pollinators. Without them, my job wouldn't be here. Well, and what are some natural ways then I could ask both of you? I mean, do either of you use pesticides? Charlie, do you use pesticides in your garden? No, Isaac, do you? No, I do natural pesticides. So what are the natural ways in which you can keep pests out? Um, so tomato leaves are a great pesticide. It's insecticide for your, for your garden. So take the, take the tomato leaves, put them in cheesecloth, put them in water. I always use rainwater, not city tap water. Put them inside there, let it soak for 12 hours. Pull the cheesecloth out, take the, the tomato leaves, put that in your compost. And then well, take, take that water, put it in a spray bottle, and I'll spray my plants up and down the root of the soil, underneath the, the leaves, everywhere. It's a great insecticide for your plants. Charlie, what about you? I know someone once told me she uses eggshells to keep out. Mm. Eggshells, when they're crushed up very fine, can do two things. One is it, they provide like a grit on the surface of the soil. So any of the crawling insects crawl across an eggshell and it lacerates their belly as they go and they die. So it's very good for slug control and that sort of thing. Um, and crushed eggshells, of course, slowly will decompose and add calcium to the soil, which is a required nutrient for all plants. But um, Isaac's idea with the tomato leaves is a good one. I've also done that with garlic, uh, where you, again, mush the garlic, soak it, and make a, make a spray, make a garlic spray, which will kill insects on contact. Very cool. All right. Thanks, Charlie. We need to take a short break. There's more when we return. Don't throw this out. You can grow something in it. So what I did... I did it this way. This has kale growing out of, side of it, out of it. This one has a miniature sunflower growing inside of it. So just imagine these on your balcony.
Well, as you can see with our 360 degree camera here, I'm located in the heart of the city. And for those of you who are living in an apartment or condo like myself, it means having limited to no space for gardening. And with social distancing measures still in place, it's got locals thinking outside the box when it comes to growing their own greens. Well, fellow Torontonian Mikey had these same thoughts as well, and after losing his main source of income, has started selling vertical gardens online. Best part is, he'll meet up with you just about anywhere in the city, socially distanced, rain or shine. So I just wanted to tell you, your, your little business is amazing. Thank you so much. And I much wish you so much luck with it. I'm hoping to plant little things in here to make my life happy. My gardening skills are horrible, but I'm really hoping with the good tools <laughs> and good materials, maybe I'll change it all around. So maybe I'll have Mikey to thank for you know, eating healthier and developing a new project for both myself and my family. Mikey was kind enough to take me back to his place, socially distanced of course, to show me what it takes to put one of these vertical gardens together. He's created over 50 of them since the beginning of the year, and after hearing what everyone had to say about them, I had to buy one for myself. All right, so I've just come back from the store and I've picked up some thyme and some basil, things I use quite often when I'm cooking. Now it's time to get planting. Mikey was concerned with varnishes and stains in that it might toxify the soil and potentially do harm to your vegetables. So he's just left it kind of the way it is. However, he has coated each interior tier with melted beeswax, which provides nutrients for the soil and the plant consistently, which is amazing. Each soil bed is also slanted to promote proper water flow through the bed, which then goes down the spigot and into the next tier. Pretty cool, huh? Well, would you look at these beautiful herbs? What do you guys think? Now, the only thing left to do, of course, is to enjoy them in some of my cooking, but pretty soon, once these plants start growing, I have the feeling this balcony will start to become the envy of the other tenants. And if you guys at home have been inspired to try some of your own home gardening, be sure to tune in to Zoomer Radio's The Garden Show with Charlie Dobbin. Thanks, Sean. If you've been dreaming of creating a beautiful garden, don't be discouraged by a limited budget or space. There are multiple DIY garden decor projects you can create using recycled materials. Isaac joins me now with Clever Garden Upcycles. Isaac, first of all, gardening can be expensive. So for those looking to stretch their budget a little bit, what are some kinds of items that can be repurposed from around the house? So I have an egg carton right here that I have, have my seeds sprouted in. So this is, a, this is arugula. So don't throw out your egg cartons, great for starting your seeds in. The thing about this is that you can peel these off and put the whole thing in the garden. So don't have to take the plants out. This whole thing, this, this cardboard is great for, your, great for your soil. That's one thing. Another thing I tell people to do, when you have all your almond, your almond beverage or your oat, your oat beverage, or maybe you're doing dairy products, you have your leftover carton, don't throw this out. You can grow something in it. So what I did, I did it this way. This has kale growing out of, side of it, out of it. This one has a miniature sunflower growing inside of it. So just imagine these on your balcony, okay? Or in your backyard even. Another thing you can do is use your old two liter plastic pop bottles or soda bottles if you want. You can use those to grow lots of things in. What I do is I, will, I take it and convert it into its own hydroponic system. And what I grow out of it is a pineapple. <laughs> now I have a pineapple growing because pineapples take a lot of water. So now that it's its own hydroponic system, the water is here already. Put the water in the bottom, it wickies up with the, with the wash top. Now pineapple's growing. I you love can also that. Use, go ahead. I love that. And I will <laughs> say, if you don't like the look of a milk carton, you can always paint it. Everything can be painted. Exactly. Exactly. Use your creativity. If you don't like, if you don't like the look of this, paint it. Make it your own design. <laughs> Maybe put your own name on it. If you have those old, the black, um, Takeout containers that people get, yep. use those. I have peas growing inside this one right here. So these peas, I'm gonna take these peas out and put them outside in my garden. They're great for seed starters. So use what you have, because like you said, gardening, especially in the beginning, can be very, very expensive. My whole goal for people is to upcycle what you have in your home. Use it at least five times before you decide you're gonna recycle it or put it in the trash, right? All right, so in front of me, I have two yogurt containers. What are we doing with these? All right. What plants, do you have any plants in front of you too? I've got some hot peppers, some Pepper. lettuce, thyme, lavender, a couple others. So you can put, ooh, 
I think the lettuce will look really nice inside those. Okay. So what, so what do I lettuce, do? What you're gonna do, move this over here. I'm gonna pretend I have, these are my yogurt cups right here. These little small little cups. So let me see your lettuce again. Here we go. Ooh, that's nice. So what you're gonna do, take your yogurt cup, take your soil. You have your soil? Yep. You have your little trowel with you? Yep. What I would do is take my stick with soil, put it in the trowel. But first of all, do you have a hole in the bottom of your, your cup? I do. I did just notice that. Perfect. Can you need that drainage? Got it. What you're going to do, you're going to fill it up with soil. Mm -hmm. I go about halfway if you want to, because you're going to add the soil from the other plant, just the, the lettuce in there. Okay. Make a little hole. I'm going to make it bigger so you can actually see what I'm doing. So I'm using this cup right here. This is going like this. Make a little hole in it. Yeah. Right? Yep. And you, have, you see? Yep, you got it. You got it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hold the bill. Now let me see your plant again. So with your plant, what you're going to do, my plants are not in the, in the container like that. So take the plant, take your fingers, put it over the plant like this, and then take it, turn it upside down. But put it over top of your soil first. Put it over top of the soil. So you don't, put, don't get your, your table dirty. There you go. Now slowly oh. pull the plant out. Are you coming out? Yes. Awesome. Now, what you want to do is keep some of the soil with the roots at the bottom of the plant. And that, that can go inside your, your little yogurt cup. So when you're taking it out, you take out your plant. I have a plant here. This is out. This is going to go inside my cup, like that. I'm a beginner. That's okay. That's why I'm here. Let's be nice and gentle. If you make a mess, put it there. You go. Put it on the soil. Take out the soil if you need to. Yeah, you're getting it. You're getting it. Any excess soil, just take the soil out. Yep. There we go. It's all. It's all beginning. It's all about learning how to enjoy playing with the earth and your plants. Perfect. <laughs> So that looks like leaf lettuce to me. So that lettuce, that lettuce can be cut back. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's so bad. So, okay. Yep. Kind of press it How's in there. That? There we go. There you, go. you got it. So with that lettuce, I can tell right now that le that lettuce, you can pick the leaves off when you want to eat them, and the leaves will keep growing back. What other plants do you have there? Okay. So why don't we try this? The hot pepper. Ooh, hot pepper. The the hot pepper should be in a bigger container. Bigger container. Should I use this? Yes. So do the exact same thing that you did with the yogurt container. Okay. Yeah, go to your soil, put your soil in, go about maybe a third to a half. Okay. All right. Go a hole. Yeah, then get your plant. Make your little hole. There you go. Make the hole. Mm -hmm. Find your plant. Mm -hmm. I'll use a small, a baby, baby stuff. Let me use this right here. You take your plant. There you go. You got it. You got it. You Look at that. Soil. Yep. Look at that. That plant is nice and happy. Look at that. Now, let me ask you um, about some garden space saving tips. What I like to do is, like, once again, go around where I, where I am and, and find things. So what I did at home was I found a nice box just sitting there. And so I thought, wow, I don't have a lot of space. I can actually use that box to garden in. So in this box right here, I have trailing nasturtiums over the side. I have peas over here. I have two of the small, small sunflowers growing in the back. So the trailing nasturtiums are going to be my spiller. I'm going to have my filler and then my, my thriller, which is my sunflower. Hmm. So this right here can go on your balcony, can go on your backyard if you have small space. If you have a sunroom, even better. If I don't have that, I could do another thing I did was I found an old waste paper, a waste basket I was gonna throw out. I thought, no, I'm gonna use this again. So what I, I did it. is I took plastic, put a blind on with plastic, poked holes in the bottom of it. Now I have Swiss chard growing inside of there. So this is a little space, space saver for your garden, for your condo, for your apartment. If you wanna do another one, which I'm in the process of developing, doing it again, is if you have little small bags, if you want to do vertical gardening, mm -hmm. find your bags. Even though, even the um, those shopping bags are like ninety nine cents. We have like thousands of them inside your, your apartment or your home. You can convert those into vertical gardening. So I started doing one right here, 
which has kale growing on the bottom of it. So what I'm gonna do, fill this with soil. The kale is gonna grow down the bottom, get nice and big. That's gonna fill out here. On top of here, I'm gonna have some peas growing out so, so the peas can trail down. And this is a cute little bag for kids. So the kids can actually draw, there's like this um, a dinosaur on, on it. So they can actually <laughs> color this and hang it up. That's so super neat. I love that idea. Well, thanks so much, Isaac. That's awesome. You're welcome. All right, there's more up to the break. Stay tuned. So what you're gonna do now, take your other container. Mm -hmm. You take that and place it right on top like this. When that's finished, you have your first clay pot irrigation system. Welcome back. Have you ever thought about creating your own self-watering system for your garden, whether indoor or out? Having your own irrigation system in place will not only take the difficulty out of keeping your garden watered, it can actually save you money because you don't have to use as much water. Isaac's back to walk us through how to create an easy self-watering system for your garden. Now, I know, Isaac, you've got a couple of different ways in which we can do this. Why don't we start with the first one? This is called clay pot irrigation because terracotta or clay, when formed like this, is permeable, which means the water can slowly pass through the clay, the, the pot. Mm -hmm. So you have your two terracotta pots, okay? One's gonna be the top, one's gonna be the bottom. So choose which one you want. I'm gonna choose this one to be the bottom, which means that this is gonna be inside the ground. Okay. So you have to make sure there's the holes in the bottom, it's gotta be plugged. If you have your glue with you, I have my glue in a little container, a little cup like this. So take your glue and find your, your plastic bottle, your glue. Okay. You have your lid from your pot. Awesome. So you're gonna put glue on the bottom of that. I glue the bottom like this. For me, I don't care if the glue gets out. And that that cap right there is going to be go on the inside of the pot. Now take your glue around the rim, around here. Place glue all around the rim of the the, the pot. All right, here goes. Yeah, just like that. How much glue? As much as you can. Not too much glue. This is nothing because you got to seal it. Because what you want to do is seal it. So what you're going to do now, take your other container. Mm -hmm. You take that and place it right on top like this. Goes right on top. Just like that. Got it. Just like that. So what I do sometimes is I'll take some of the glue, if you can. I'll just put it around the sides for extra seal. Right. So it's going to go around the sides, just around the sides where that little crease is. Yep. An extra seal for your product. When that's finished, you have your first clay pot irrigation system. This right here can come in different sizes. I have smaller ones I made. I have larger ones I made. So when you're gardening with this, so the top part has the hole that's open. Make sure that top part's open. So take off that the um, sticker. Got it. Awesome. Because this whole thing, when you're outside in your garden, you're gonna dig a hole and place the whole thing in your garden, except for about an inch. So you can actually see it. So the whole thing about this is that this is permeable. The water, the water's inside here. If your soil's dry, the water will slowly start to leach into the soil. If your soil is already damp with water, the water's gonna stay inside here until it's needed. So you fill it with water? Yep, you'll fill it with water. Place it in the ground first, get your water container, you fill it with water. Make sure you have make sure you have a, a, a rock or something to put on top because if you don't, it will evaporate. Mm -hmm. Cover it up. It's already inside the ground. Fill it with water. Walk away. A simpler a simpler one. Okay. Will be to have just this the, um, the container so the the, the pot Got with it. the tray it comes with. What you're gonna do? Take your take your glue. You're gonna put glue around the lip of the tray just like that. All around here, or if it's big, you can put the glue inside wherever you want to put it. There you go. Yeah, on the bottom. A little bit more to mine. Okay. The great thing about this glue is that it dries, it dries clear. Mm -hmm. So that was, that's an easy method of doing one. How does this one work? So once again, the whole thing goes, goes into the ground. Yeah. And you water the same way as the other one. Yep, take the sticker off. Okay, I'll just... I right, just poke the hole. Got it. And that whole thing goes into your ground. Isaac, this is super cool. 
And then are cool. there any other, I mean, you could do it with these terracotta pots. What are mm -hmm. some other ways in which you could do this? Okay, well, here's another one. If you have your pop bottles, your small water container, water bottles. Yeah. So this one is, this one's not, this one's not paramount because it's plastic, but what you can do, you can poke holes all through this. I would go about, I would do 12 holes, not too many holes. So put 12 in there, take this whole thing, put it into the ground. Keep your lid on, so you take the lid off, fill that with water, and boom, you have another watering system for your plants. But make sure, what I always tell people, make sure if you can find your plastic that is like BPA free or something like that, all right? And how does it keep the soil the right amount of damp? It's, it's because the soil, part of the soil is blocked, so you have about well, four inches of soil that can be hit by the sun. Yeah. And below that, it's not a lot of sun. So it's nice and damp down there, nice and cool. So the water will slowly, slowly, slowly evaporate into the soil. It is, when you, when you pull them up, when I pull mine up all in the, the fall time, you can actually see the roots of the plants going towards the water system. All right, I love that. When we come back, we'll hear some final thoughts from our panelists. Welcome back. It's that time in the show for final thoughts. So Isaac, why don't you start us off? My final thoughts for you, everyone. Don't be afraid to garden this year. Get out there, enjoy it. If you're only going to garden, start with one thing, the, the plant you love to eat or want to watch to grow. And Charlie. That's it. I like that final thought. <laughs> um, yeah, don't be afraid. And, and know your, your conditions. Like that, to me, one of the things is be successful. So choose to grow something that will grow in your conditions. If you have sun or shade, or you have wind or not, or, you know, just know that first and choose a plant that will grow. And you'll be surprised. You'll get the gardening bug too. All right, well, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much to my panelists for being here and for being patient with me, the beginner, and for you at home watching. We'll see you soon. For now, it's time to zoom out.